Hey gang, I'm at St. Mary's Cemetery here in a place called Menominee Falls in Wisconsin. I'm just outside of Milwaukee, just a little bit to the north, northwest. And I'm here to visit the grave today of a young woman who was murdered when she was only 19 years old. And this is back in the 1960s. We're going back 50 some years, but the case remains today unsolved. And I think that we, if we, get the word out here, I think we can help get this thing, find out who killed her because they, I did the research on it, they have the DNA profile of the killer, but they went to CODIS and they did it this way and that way all the years and believe me, they care, the police department here cares, but I don't know if they have tapped into the latest and the greatest ways using familial DNA matching. That's how it's done this last year. Remember the Julianne Hansen video I did two weeks ago? Naperville, they caught the welder in Minnesota. He's in his 70s and they tracked down the family tree and they nailed this guy. Well, they should be doing it here because they have the profile. Call that company, say like Identifinders, Colleen. Call Colleen up. And I'm talking now to the police department here in Menominee Falls. And you know what? They may be doing that already. But I think if we can all write to them, call them, get hopefully this video makes its way around. And anyway, they need to be doing that because we can catch this killer now through familial DNA matching. Call Parabon. They can do a, a fo you know, they can do that composite sketch. Is it a man? Is it a woman? Maybe they know already. Maybe they're doing it already. But anyway, I wanted to pay tribute to her grave, get the word out, and let's take a look around and... Diane Olkwitz was murdered here in Menominee Falls at a factory on November 3rd, 1966. As I said, she was only 19 years old. That's almost 55 years ago when this happened. This is probably one of the most vicious attacks I've ever heard of. And there really appeared to be no good reason for it. And I think that if the perpetrator can be identified, I think the reason will come forward. And we're gonna talk a lot about, a lot about this story. It's, it's kind of a long story. She grew up here. She was a beautiful woman, a really kind heart. She came to the church. It was a Catholic family, is a Catholic family that she was part of. Everything was about the church, St. Mary's. If she had a problem, or she had a concern, or she had a question, it would be the church where she would come. She was very devoted. The family was very devoted. They lived just down the block from the St. Mary Catholic Church, where they were parishioners, and in high school, Diane did date. She went steady with a couple of boys, but she did not get serious until she met a man shortly after graduating named Donald Heirlmeyer. He was from Milwaukee here, and they soon became engaged. So Diane found a job as a secretary at this place called Kenworth Manufacturing. They were a stamping company here, and she had worked here at that company for about a year, and she had moved out of the house. She rented an apartment with her brother, Edward's girlfriend. And things were moving along. 
shortly thereafter, she got married. She well, she didn't get married. She got engaged to Donald. Donald had been drafted into the army, and unfortunately, he had left. He had just left for basic training at Fort Hood, Texas, and she was very lonely without him. So she kept herself busy by swimming, knitting classes in the evening. She took a part-time job as a hostess at the old restaurant, I don't think it's here anymore, called the Dutchland Dairy Restaurant. I guess it was quite the staple here in town. And everything was going good. Now the thing about it was, is she was secretary at this company, is that all, all the people would leave, I think about three o'clock, and she had to stay late every day to answer the phone, do the bookkeeping, do, doing whatever she needed to be doing. And she, she was alone every day. And I think that's the first clue the killer probably knew her. He, he or she, got to say she, we don't know, probably a he, must have known that for that hour every day she was alone. So, one day, the fateful day, She was following the routine, and after work, she would usually pick up her best friend, Diane Zimmer. And Diane worked nearby, and the two would drive home together. And on November 3rd, Diane did not show up. So, Diane Zimmer was obviously concerned. So she got a hold of not being able to drive. She connected with her employer's wife and they said, hey, let's go over to Kenworth and let's check on Diane, what's going on? So that's what they did. They come in the parking lot and they see Diane's car is sitting there. And they're thinking, okay, well, the doors are locked. This is strange. And they start looking in the windows. And they knew about where Diane's desk was. And they look in, and what do they see? They see her purse sitting on the desk. They see her coat hanging on the closet. No sign of Diane. So because all the doors were locked, they weren't sure what to do next, so what did they do? They walked over to the plant next door where Diane's brother Dennis worked. So the three of them come back just as the supervisor from Kenworth comes and opens the door. Now they're all in there. It's 5.20 p.m. And they walk around the corner inside the shipping room. And there's Diane lying about 20 feet away, face down in a pool of blood. Wow. Well, the first thing everyone noticed, and of course she was examined by Waukesha County Coroner at the time, his name was James Welch, that she had died of massive hemorrhaging due to multiple stab wounds in the chest, neck, and head. And get this, she had been stabbed 106 times, 106 times. The blade of the knife 
they kind of determined that it was a three and a half inch blade, not super long, and it was had one cutting edge. So when I hear that, that tells me it's like a steak knife. She had 30 stab wounds in her head, neck, and face, and 35 stab wounds in rows, in rows, down the sides of her back, where she had been stabbed repeatedly while she was laying on her stomach. Now you have to wonder who or why that kind of rage right? She had not been sexually assaulted, so it wasn't about that. Her dress was pulled up, but her undergarments were undisturbed. So they had the funeral, and uh, the funeral was attended by 250 people, including her fiancé, Donald. It is said that he was just overcome with grief. He got emergency leave from basic training to come home for the funeral and was in complete shock. Complete shock. So from there, the police interviewed multiple people, all the usual stuff. And there were six suspects. There were suspects. And it seemed to be heading in the right direction. The case, that is. There was a patrolman named Dan Schram, who would retire 26 later as captain. He also served as village alderman here. He remembered that night well. He was one of the first on scene. And he was actually hiding for a few nights in case, you know, they say the killer, the killer returns to the scene of the crime, might do a drive-by, but no such luck. Nothing happened. But they did speculate the killer was familiar with the plant's layout, probably knew her. And that's kind of what they were saying. They had interviewed over 500 people to get those six suspects, but they all had alibis. Now, Diane's family, Diane's family and friends said, hey, there was one creep. There was one creep. The son of, the son of the owner of the company where she worked. He was tracking her. He was obsessed with her. She hated him. She was like, stay away from me. I want nothing to do with you. And he kept, he was obsessed. He, he kept bugging her. She was totally creeped out by him. He said, he did it. He must have done it because she wouldn't go out with him. So they questioned him. They got him in there. They interrogated the hell out of him. But he had an alibi, his family. His family said he was with us. Now, you know what that reminds me of? I did the video way back, I think it was last year, on the little girl that in Sycamore that was murdered by that creep that got away with it, probably. And that was his alibi. The family stood behind him. But the mother, in that case, confessed on her deathbed that he was gone. He wasn't with them. And she even said he did it. Now that's the other case, but just using it as an example. So family may be covering up. You know, blood is thicker than water, right? Family blood stick together no matter what. What would each of us do? I can't say, you know, who am I to 
Who am I to say? But that was the situation. So weeks turn into months, months turn into years, and nothing happened. Nobody was caught. So what do we do? We wait for DNA technology to catch up. We have DNA profiles. And lo and behold, we now have the family. Now, here's what happened. So they're like, the, we got to figure out if this guy did it, right? We got to figure it out. So he ends up dying, but they cremate him. <laughs> Interesting. He's gone, cremated, don't know where he is. So credit the Menominee Falls Police and maybe the FBI, whoever was involved, they get a court order and they dig up his parents, disinter them, but their DNA profile, familia, does not match up. Wow. Shoots that whole thing down. So now we've got to really rule that, cre that creepy guy out. That's all he was, maybe just a creepy guy. Wow, where do you go from here? Well, I'll tell you where you go from here. We have, <laughs> I'm going to repeat it over and over. We have our favorite, our favorite topic of what's going, this is just, guys, this is all happening just in the last year or so, right? Well, last two or three years. The pillowcase murderer kind of started all out in San Francisco. That's how they got him, family members, and it's just been going like this nailing these people it's so great by the way we have people from what i heard i didn't do research on this but we actually have people now trying to make legislation so that we can't do that privacy blah 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 and i just want to say to you people if you're watching you're you're just scum because i'm not going to get into it you're you're just you're the enemy you're the enemy within isn't it typical? There's always people on the wrong side. But anyway, we've got this going. We've got this DNA profile, and I really hope that the Menominee Falls Police right now, while we're watching this, while you're watching this, is doing what I'm talking about. They are working with Parabon, Nanolabs, or they are working with Colleen. They are using the techniques that are available now because in my mind, this happened, what, in 1966. The killer, if the killer was, let's say he was 20 years old, he's gonna be in his 70s, right? And if he's older, he's gonna be in his 80s, or he or she, right? So I look at it as a 50-50 that they're still alive. But, gosh, wouldn't it be great? We really need to find out who it is. Here is Diane's grave. And she has not forgotten, let me tell you. The people here all remember her. Even the people with the cemetery, a shout out to a man named Phil who helped me locate her grave. He knew right where it was. She is not forgotten. Let's take a look at the stone. Diane J. Olkwitz. She was born September 27th, 1947. And that fateful day was November 3rd, 1966. And alive in Christ.
Well, let's talk about Diane. I want to say a few words about her. Her sister, Debbie, who was nine years old when this happened, said she was a very warm and caring person, always looking out for other people. She was just a generous person that way. Her other sister, Patty, said, who was four years younger, remembers her as sensitive but outgoing. She said, we were very close. She said, she was pretty much my mentor. I looked up to her. By the time Diane finished high school, she had matured into a tall, slender brunette with a quick wit and a bright smile. She was a delight. She had a great sense of humor. She was really beautiful. It's sad because we hear this after a death like this. The family really doesn't recover. It, it takes a devastating toll on everybody. And as I say, it's a life sentence. Her fiance, Donald, returned to basic training. He was heartbroken. The questions would never be answered. A little more than a year later on, February 16, 1968, private first class Donald was killed by a mortar round in Quang Tin province in South Vietnam. Diane's parents both died young. The stress of their daughter's murder contributing to their health issues. Mother Irene, who was diagnosed with diabetes shortly before the murder, died in 1973 of congestive heart failure at age 50. And it was said it was very hard on her that she just gave up. Diane's father, Robert, followed three years later, dying of a heart attack at age 55. Diane's sisters and brothers said it was their father did not show, he wouldn't show his emotion, but they would catch him once in a while just crying. Eldest sister Nancy died at 58, and Diane's brother Dennis, who never gave up his quest to solve his sister's murder, suffered a debilitating stroke at age 50 and died 12 years later. Today, all that remains of the family is Patty, Debbie, and their brother, Edward. They still hold out hope for some kind of closure. If you have information to help solve this, contact Lieutenant Steve Rudy of the Menominee Falls Police Department, 262-532-8705. Or, of course, there's Crime Stoppers of Waukesha County, 888-441-5505 or online. Come on, guys. Let's help solve this murder. Let's help solve. Let's, let's get some justice for Diane. Can we? If the Menominee Falls Police Department is not right now doing it, please use familial DNA matching, okay? Please. And in the meantime, may Diane rest in peace.